Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Clécio Varjão. I work for the uh, Government of British Columbia. I'm the product owner and product manager for the BC Wallet app. And today we're going to talk about our journey from uh, BC Wallet app, which has been powered by um, Hyperledger's, Hyperledger Airs by Fold. And also here with Akif. Yeah, so my name is Akif. I work with the BC government uh, on behalf of Cortex Systems. So um, I've been helping with the BC Wallet over the last little while. I'm excited for this talk. Um, I'm going to start a little bit talking about uh, what we do, BC Identity and Trust Program. So we have a big vision, providing British Columbians with choice and security online. So when we're talking about participating in a digital economy, or participating both for business or, or for fun, for pleasure, in your day-to-day -day routine. Our, our vision to enable uh, residents and of BC to be able to participate in a secure way and also have options. It's not about uh, replacing everything with digital identity. It's about an adding another channel to facilitate that transaction online. Um, our mission is to advance digital trust capabilities and build the confidence required to foster BC growing digital economy. Uh, people rely on government issues ID on their daily basis. Uh, that people want to do bigger things online, especially now since we've been through COVID. Uh, it has been very uh, visible to us that people do want to interact with the government particularly and do more interactions online. And also have the cyber threats are scaling, uh, escalating. We have seen more and more cyber threats and security that has been expanding and becoming more and more apparent. Uh, so we just need to get ourselves in front of all that, and we believe the digital identity and verifiable credential is, is a way for us to enable um, our population to play, work online, and interact in a safe, in a safe manner. All right, well, trust over IP is really what enables this entire ecosystem of digital credentials. Um, in order to understand what trust over IP is, we need to consider the way credentials are, are used in the real world today. So verifiers um, typically need to make informed decisions about individuals, such as whether they should board a, or are allowed to board a plane, um, whether they can enter a building, whether they can open a bank account. And many of these decisions are based on individuals providing information about themselves in the form of held credentials. These information exchanges typically occur in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion without a central intermediary to act on behalf of the individuals. The trust over IP framework operates on these same principles as the physical world, but at the scale and distributed nature of the digital world. Digital credentials are the tools for transferring trust from verifiers, from issuers to verifiers. And trust is established by combining cryptographic verifiability at the machine layer with human accountability in the real world. So let's take a look at how this works. So first, an issuer, which would be some sort of government issuing agency, it writes a decentralized identifier, it's just a key, and a public key to a verifiable data registry. So think of the DID and the public key as any cryptographic material that can be used to verify the credentials that they issue. A VDR, or a verifiable data registry, can be any sufficiently trusted public utility that's accessible to a verifier. And this can be a blockchain, or it can be a distributed database. So the issuer will use its private, it will publish the public key onto the, the VDR, and it will use its private key to digitally sign verifiable credentials and issues that to a qualified holder to store it in their digital wallet. The issuance process in this case is peer to peer. It does not involve the VDR at all. There's no personal data that's ever stored on the ledgers. When a verifier requests a digital proof, or for one, of, or one or more credentials from the holder, if the holder consents to it, the holder's wallet generates and returns a cryptographic proof to the verifier. Since proofs contain the issuer's DID, the verifier can use it to read the public key off the ledger and can use it to, to validate the credentials that are sent from the issuer. So this is where the trust is created. So the verifier uses the issuer's public key to verify that the proofs are valid and that the requested claims from the digital credentials have not been tampered with. 
So verifiable credential, given what Keith just said, so verifiable credential proves who issued that credential. Based on that data information, I, I know with a guarantee, without, I can verify the authenticity or who, of who issued that credential. Um, with that credential is issued to a wallet or to a, a subject, and, and in a verifiable credential as well, you, through that cryptographic material, uh, it guarantees that it has been issued by that particular individual or, or wallet holder. Um, the claims are unchanged. Again, through that cryptographic signature, you can have authenticity and guarantee that that materials has not been changed along the line and only the, the, it's, it has been provided the, as, as the issue has been uh, proved and verified. And also the claims has not been revoked. I, can, uh, I could potentially issue a credential to just about anything and to about everyone, but it doesn't necessarily mean that those credentials are going to be valid or true for forever. Some things change. Maybe we made a mistake through our process and you need to update your information. Credentials can, cannot be updated through that cryptographic signature, but they can be revoked and a new one is then issued. So we need a process to control the credentials that are no longer valid. A revocation process is a process which the issuer can unilaterally make the decision to tell and signal the verifiers, hey, this credential is no longer valid, you should not accept. Um, I'm gonna say emphasis on should not. There are some possible valid use cases where a revoked or expired credential might be useful. Um, in, the, in the verifiable credential ecosystem, but that's not really a common use case, but from when, when a credential is revoked, is a signal to the, for the verifier, please don't accept this anymore for a number of the reasons. I'm gonna briefly highlight a little bit of what we're doing. So right now we have a limited production uh, use case that is in production right now. Uh, BC Wallet app, it's available through the app stores, it's available for, for anybody who, can, who wants to download, uh, but there's not services that has been enabled yet. In our limited production use case, we have been interacting with the loss of, with the loss of site of BC, where we're working towards issuing a very fabric credential for lawyers in BC. It's a way for lawyers to digitally prove that they are an active member of the Law Society of BC in a good standing, and they are authorized to, to practice law in BC. Um, in those case that we are providing right now, it's a, it's a joint effort in partnership with the court services branch where lawyers can use the digital, the digital credential, the digital lawyer credential to prove that they are a lawyer in good standing with law, in the law society of BC and have access to court materials and sensitive documents. So just provide a high level identity assurance. Our, loss, our credentials right now, within we have two credentials. One of them that I mentioned is the one provided by Law Society of BC. They provide the identity that they verify, verifies that a lawyer is a lawyer in a good standing. And we also have another credential that we are, right, right now we're calling a person credential. That is a person credential that is based on our BC Services Card program, an identity management program from government, uh, government of BC. Um, and that information we are integrating with BC Services Card, with it, which is a holder app for, for, another, for another digital identity uh, mechanism for out that, that you can use to log on into other government services. Um, we are combining all those to, uh, in a controlled and limited manner, we're able to, to exercise and roll out this to, uh, to our use case. So from a lawyer perspective, they, they go into their um, Law Society member portal and they're able to get the, manage to get their own lawyer credential. They're able to uh, issue themselves a credential based on Law Society system of records, um, as well as they're able to revoke. If they get a new phone or if they lost a phone, they're able to reissue themselves a credential or revoke a credential. So it's a self, it's a self service from Law Society of VC. Um, so there's also a use case where Law Society of BC could unilaterally make that decision if uh, a lawyer has been, uh, is no longer allowed to practice law, it's not in good standing, Law Society of BC can unilater unilaterally make a decision to revoke that credential. And that for us solves a lot of problems within the court services branch. One of the reasons that, one of the biggest problems for us is we have this legislative entity who are uh, assigned the, the, the the authority to regulate the profession, but there's not a lot of back and forth between 
the government and their authority about like a list of lawyers who are the active lawyers in BC. And that list is quite dynamic. So for us, we are able to, court services branch is able to quickly and with a high level of assurance and, 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 and trust, uh, validate that yes, you are a lawyer in fact, and you are authorized and you are in good standing lawyer and without sharing any information. It's only the lawyer who is sharing their own information. There is no third party invo involved. It's not the law society, of, law society of BC disclosing that information to court service branch. It's the lawyers themselves disclosing that information about themselves to court services branch. Um, we refer to the lawyers, they're using the BC Wallet app and we call that the holder app. They're, they're playing the holder. They're receiving credentials, they're holding credentials. And, and then we have the governor, governor BC through court services branch where they provide access to court materials. And in this uh, trust triangle, they're acting as a verifier. So they're verifying that you have your two piece of ID or person credential and your, law, uh, your lawyer member card from the Law Society of BC. And, and they can do uh, that validation. So if either one of those credentials for some reason get invalidated or revoked, uh, the lawyer automatically no longer have access. And the process of revoking access right now, it's very time consuming and it takes time for that, uh, for that material to propagate. It, you have a physical card that the lawyer presents and sometimes you can go to a system and, and they're still valid. So with a digital, with a digital credential, they have that very agile way of uh, knowing with a high level assurance that that's a lawyer who is in a good standing with the Law Society of BC. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the motivation since we're talking about BC Wallet app and Hyperledger's areas by FODE. A little bit of a journey. About two years ago, uh, maybe a little bit more, uh, we were looking for what is a user-friendly user -friendly wallet for the verifiable credential ecosystem. Uh, we did a, a lot of research and we looked around. There is a few options out there but through user research, we found out that it was fairly complicated and fairly complex for the average user to understand and use a verifiable credential. So we import into this, into this journey and how can we make verifiable credential? We, we trust in the technology, we, we embrace this distributed ecosystem, but we need to bring our users along. If nobody wants to, if nobody can use this credential in a very user-friendly way, this model is not gonna work. So we wanted a way to buy, to get buy-in from users. So for us, it's very important that the BC Wallet app and, and Ares Bifold being very, very user-friendly. Someone that is, can uh, not necessarily give a, a joke around, like my, my in-laws, my mom, my dad, they're able to use that verifiable credential uh, fairly easily in a day-to-day -day routine. So we had two options. We could start from scratch and make our own wallet, or as we look around, there was a, some code under Hyperledger Foundation about areas by fold. We took a look and we decided, how about, it was a little bit abandoned back at the, back at the day, about two years ago, or just starting, and we decided to look into that code and we sort of adopt that. It's like, okay, let's work towards that open source, open source community. It needs some, some, it needs some love, it needs some, some, some effort, some work needs to be done that, but that's something that we can work with. Um, and then we decided that we're gonna be leveraging the work that has already been done. There was a lot of good work there and you just need a little bit of more active development and we'll get to a point where it could be fairly user friendly. So we're very, we're, very, we're committed and we are both a Kif and R. We are maintainers, also maintainers of Ares uh, Bifold, which in GitHub is called Ares Mobile Agent React, React Native. Native. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful. It's a very long name, <laughs> but if you, if you look for Bifold, you, you find that. It's, 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 a, it's a nickname. Um, and then there was uh, another, another question for us is we could have an option to simply fork that code and thank you, we're gonna fork the code, make your own changes and thank you very much for the code, bye, see you later. Um, we, we talked about it and we, we thought that this was not a good way to build community. We, we want you to really promote the idea of open source and open source is not just about having their code available, it's about having an open development having something that other organizations or even other government entities could potentially use. 
and we have been working with other organizations throughout the world, including other jurisdictions in Canada, but also all over the world. So we have made a decision to, again, adopt areas, uh, areas by fold. We made some tweaks and we made some changes to enable areas by fold from a product to work more of a framework where you could, you could get place parts of it and customize a lot of it. So from our perspective, we have our own terms and condition of the app. We have our own onboarding process of, of how we wanted your users to experience the app, some instructions. And we also needed some integration on how to obtain that person credential. So that integration with our current identity manager system, that is custom code to BC Wallet. But most of those, most of the code is in Ares by Fold. So if you want a verifiable credential wallet, Ares by Fold, it's, it's production ready, it's there, you can customize and put it on callers. Sometimes I joke around that if you don't like the Xbox theme that is black and, and green, you can always get in blue. <laughs> uh, because they're very similar. I would say the 99% of the code is Ares by Fold. It's very little customizations that we are adding. And we try as much as possible to contribute and work at upstream project. So all new features that we deem and we prioritize through a product management lifecycle, we always prioritize and bring that aboard and release that to the open source community as well. All right, so let's just quickly talk about the building blocks for BC Wallet. So as Clesio mentioned, Bifold initially started off as its own, uh, of an application on its own, it was its own wallet implementation. And the team uh, restructured the code base to export core components of it as a library. Um, which we then consume, which could then be consumed by other React Native apps, effectively making it a framework for custom wallet implementations or layering on your own customizations, which is what the BC Wallet does. So the approach has enabled developers to put their own themes, their own components, while taking advantage of the core capabilities of Bifold. So Bifold is built with React Native and utilizes Aries Framework JavaScript, uh, which is a Hyperledger Aries agent implementation that focuses on mobile digital credential solutions. Um, underneath that, there's a number of other Hyperledger Aries libraries responsible for things like structuring, signing, and verifying credential data, storing and retrieving the credentials from the wallet, and for looking up the publicly verifiable information from the data uh, registries or ledgers. So right now, BC Wallet relies on, a, on an Indie verifiable data registry, but AFJ actually supports a number of different uh, ledgers. So it is ledger agnostic, and it provides a lot of flexibility under the hood, So which means that by virtue of using AFJ, uh, up, Bifold will also get that customizability going forward. Um, yep. So I think we can probably skip. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll skip this because we're going to show this in the demo. But um, So some of the technical features of Bifold and the BC Wallet, um, because it's built with React Native, we get cross-platform support right out of the box. So the wallet operates on both Android and iOS. It's available in both the Play Store and on uh, the App Store, so uh, Google Play. Uh, the wallet supports multiple languages, including English and French. We even have a team in Brazil that contributed Portuguese translations, allowing us to support that in the wallet. And if anybody wants to see a supported language, we're happy to take contributions. All you got to do is translate the, the files uh, into whatever language, and we'll support it. Uh, the wallet supports multiple authentication mechanisms, so you can use a basic PIN, but you can also use device biometrics if you want. Um, it supports, as Clesio mentioned, a number of customizations from the theme to the terms and conditions content uh, to an onboarding carousel when the uh, users first open the app. And you'll see all of this in the demo when we go through BC Wallet. So one of the things that we're actually really, really proud of that we implemented was the credential branding. Now, this is really important because when issuers issue their credentials to the wallet, they want a sense of, of presence in the wallet. They want their branding. And so any issuer right now can, can create their own custom branding for their issued credentials, and they will be displayed prominently in every single wallet that they issue to. And this is enabled via the Overlays Capture architecture, which if we have a bit of time, we might be able to talk about it. But um, you'll see it in the demo. You'll see branded credentials. Um, and then basically, as we continue to grow as a community, we're discovering a wide range of use cases that we want to support. We recognize that a one-size-fits-all approach is not really going to work for everyone's needs. So we're taking steps to make the libraries and frameworks much more modular and more customizable. So we've already started to take this uh, step of 
of, of modularizing a lot of the libraries and frameworks, making them more performant, and we're trying to bring that up into the application layer in Bifold. So there's a, there's a star next to modular there. Um, so why don't we uh, jump into the, okay. the demo. So for the demo, we're, we're going to use the, the BC Wallet Showcase, which has been uh, generously contributed by one of our open source contributors, but we've adapted it in BC to, to showcase how the BC Wallet works. So when you, guys, when you get into the showcase, um, and if you start. Uh, okay, I'll go through, and you just either fill. So basically, I'm gonna I'm gonna open up my phone here, and uh, let's say I've just downloaded the 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 wallet. But um, when we go to get started, so there's a number there's a couple different characters that you can choose from. So one of them is a student, and the other one is is Joyce the lawyer. So we're gonna we're gonna play Joyce the lawyer because that's the use case that we talked about. So assume that uh, Joyce is basically a lawyer that practices in, in BC. So she's she's got her her, uh, her physical credentials. Um, but as part of BC's digital strategy, they've started to move things online, which allows her to access things like court materials and stuff online. But in order for her to do that, she needs digital credentials. She's not going to be able to use physical credentials. Okay. So in this scenario, in this showcase, that is, it is publicly available. If you're out of curiosity, you can, you can run through this demo yourself. Um, so Akif is just showing there is a little bit of the moment you install the app, you're going to go through the onboarding process with a little bit of explanation what it is, what is the wallet, how wallet or how it works. Um, you can then, once you've gone through the setup, you can get started. There is a, a very good terms and conditions that I strongly recommend to read. It's very fun. Um, I spent a lot of time reviewing. Um, we're going to then set up a pin for the wallet. Again, this pin is also used uh, as a part of your encryption key when, when manipulating the object inside the wallet. Um, security is our number one priority, to again, to preserve privacy. So it's important that everything is it's, it's encrypted. And that's provided out of the box for some of the libraries that we are, also, we are leveraging from the Hyper, from Hyperledger Foundation. Things like Hyperledger, Ursa Hyper, and Hyperledger Ares Framework JavaScript already provide all those encryption. I provide Ascar as well for the storage part. Provide the, those those encryption and how do we manipulate objects fairly easily? All right. um, we can enable biometric biometric authentic, biometric authentic, authentication is provided as a ease of use. Uh, you can enable or you you cannot. Is provided most of our users. Um, the, uh, want are familiar with the biometrics authentication process, but it's important to emphasize that we as BC government, we do not collect biometrics. It's only the biometric that has been registered um, on your device itself. So we only ask for your device, do you, are, are you, are you who has, are you, do you provide the biometric that has been previously enrolled to unlock your phone? It's a yes or no. We do not collect those, bio, but those biometric materials. Right. So in, in the first scenario here, we're going to go to the step where um, Akif, who's going to be playing Joyce here, he's going to be getting lawyer credential. So he logs, uh, he logs in through to the lawyer, law, law Society of BC member portal, go through a session of the, uh, of the portal where they are, he's presented to option to get a very, uh, their digital credential, and they, then they are presented to a QR code. Opens up BC Wallet, he scans that QR code, and fairly quickly, you are presented with a digital credential. I kind of scanned that one too fast, so. It's, it's okay. <laughs> he has an option to, again, a, a credential is proposed. As part of the protocol, there is a, a proposal of that credential. You have, an, you have a, a opportunity to verify your data, and you can then accept, accept that credential. So once I click accept, the credential is now has been issued, has been signed, signed by the issuer, and it now belongs, it exists within that wallet. Um, again, that credential can only be used by this wallet um, and can only provide what is called proof, uh, a verifiable presentation from the wallet that it has been issued to. You can potentially copy all the data elements of that credential, but it's still not able to provide the cryptographic validation that has been issued to you or to that particular wallet. All right, so we got to get one more credential, right? Yes, so, right. so the next step is um, this step is a little bit opaque for us from when, when the lawyers uh, uh, get their person credential. 
Within the app, they're presented with an option to acquire and get their present credential as well. As we, we use a verifiable credential as a feature flag, um, and we use that throughout our, our wallet as well, we can use as, as a feature flag. So when, you, when they receive a, a lawyer credential, now suddenly we're able to unlock other features within the wallet. We know that that person is now within your limited production um, uh, scenario, and they are able to do other stuff. All right. You can then accept that, that uh, person credential, and now we have two credentials in the lawyer, one for the law lawyer credential from Law Society of BC, and another one from another person credential from Government of British Columbia. So now we're gonna go through the process of how do we verify that that credential is valid. So we're gonna go through the process of how do a lawyer get access to court materials. Um, so in this case here, uh, in order for me to get access to court materials online or as Joyce, I need to present two pieces of information. One, that I'm a real person. So I'm gonna have to present that I have a person credential but also that I'm a practicing, a valid practicing lawyer. So there's two pieces of, two credentials that are being asked for, and there's pieces of information that are being asked from either of the credentials. So throughout this process, again, it's presented with a QR code for verification. This time, um, it's scanning a QR code for doing a proof request, or for doing a verification and, and doing a verifiable proof. Um, one of the things that you're gonna notice that he's presented with, uh, all, those are all the elements that are being asked by the verifier, but are not all the elements within the credential. One important feature for us in this verifiable credential ecosystem, particularly to what is, uh, to that unknown creds credential, is that enables the users to do what is the verifier to do uh, selective disclosure. I can ask only certain pieces of information of that credential and it still provide cryptographic signature of truth and authenticity without requiring all the data elements. In fact, in some proofs, you don't need any data at all. It's called a predicate proof. So for example, if I wanted to verify that I'm over 18, you don't actually need to know my date of birth. You just need to know that I have a credential with a date of birth that specifies that I'm over 18. So that information actually doesn't even get transferred. In this case, they're asking for those specific pieces of information from these specific credentials. So you'll notice that when I share them to Court Services BC, the information gets sent over. You can see that they can see these fields. They're going to validate it, and now I can get access to the online court materials as a lawyer. So, so once we do that, we've gone through the whole step of, of basically credential issuance and verification online. But now we're going to showcase uh, another cool tool that we just implemented in the BC Wallet, which is mobile verification. So the, the scenario that we presented to you is something like a web portal um, sort of like a web service, but there are cases where, for example, if you're a business, you might want to have verification uh, between two people, like say in a setting where you want to know whether somebody can access a, a, a premises that's over 19 years of age or something like that. Or, or simply, again, using your lawyer credential use case that is already presented that, oops, sorry, I <laughs> thought my phone was falling. Uh, you can request it, like if you want to validate that someone is actually a lawyer in BC or, or a, can practice law in BC, yeah. you can request that in a in a uh, person to person interaction. Right. You can imagine that many accreditation could could also benefit from that perspective. Um, so, for instance, if you're asking if you want to validate that someone is a physician or a doctor, you want to validate that someone is a nurse within his good standing nurse, or someone is a realtor. There has been many many scenarios where that verifiable credential could be very valuable in our day to day routine. Yeah. So, Clasio, you're going to activate the mobile verification feature. So in my case, it's already activated. Nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So what they're going to do is, and this feature is available in, from the app stores. And what Akif is referred to, how many people here have Android phones? Ah, a chunk of you. Um, have you ever used the developer mode? OK, a couple of you. So um, you can unlock a developer mode as well to see some tech preview features within BC Wallet. Um, if you tap the build version, 10 times, uh, all those features and developer options will be available. So features that are being tested out or they're in tech preview, they're available in that developer mode. And this proof request or that mobile verification is one of those features. So if you don't see it right away, it's in tech preview right now. 
And once we find, once we have been battle tested, and if we, we, we found it stable and good to go, it's going to be available through for everyone. All right. So what are you going to ask me to prove? So for you, I'm going to ask if you're over 19 and what's your. Actually, I just want to know if you're over 19. You look, you look a little bit young. There. <laughs> <laughs> the beard didn't give it away. <laughs> so for this, I'm going to, and we're going to exercise what. A key, uh, uh, just mentioned what is called zero knowledge proof. I can ask for a information to be truth or not truth without just closing the actual data underneath and un underlying data. So I'm going to ask if he's over 19, over 18. Actually, oh, there, I just found there is a little bug there. It says 19, but it's asking, actually asking 18. Um, right. So he's going to generate a QR code, and so I I can go with my wallet, and I'm going to scan this. And you can see that he's, I actually have a credential, which is the person credential, because that's what he's asking for. And, and, and the information it's asking me for is whether I'm over 18. So as a person, I can choose to decide whether I want to disclose this information or not. So if I can decline it, and then our interaction's done. But I'm going to choose to share it. And then once I do that, the information is sent. And Clesio can see that I have validated that I'm over 18, because I presented a proof with the credential that I hold. So within the mobile verifiers too, again, as a tech preview, it's being under the de uh, active development. Um, you could potentially, you can think in the situation where we are standing in line and you wanted to do multiple verifications or validations. You can just, again, do another ver and generate another QR code and you can get the next person in line with the same, the same sort of verification. Um, we are, we're showing here in this use case, in this scenario, what is called a connectionless proof request. But there's also a, another situation where I can create a more of a long-standing stand, relationship, and I can continuously ask for more and more information as we develop that interaction over time. So, in, do I go to my contact? Sorry. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So is there a way for the user who is answering to say, actually, instead of giving me my data birth, I'd like to just give you, I am greater than the age that you need to provide. So, so didn't see an option. Right. So technically, it's possible that feature has not been developed yet. Yeah. So that's, that's what is referred to from the technical perspective. That's credential negotiation. I can, as a user, oops, as a user, as a holder, I, I can make the decision and say, you're asking for two information, but I, I don't think, uh, I don't trust you enough, or you think you're asking too much. By the way, I'm only going to release those two pieces of information. Um, and that's, that's possible, and it's a feature that hasn't been developed yet. Where are we at on time? 4.30. OK. okay. Just one last quick one. Um, hopefully, you guys will like this one. So, do I go to my contacts? No, you just scan the QR code oh, now. Okay, sorry. So, in this scenario, we uh, imagine that, like right now, you're in, conf in a conference. You're establishing your connections. So, yeah. So right now, we're just connecting. It means that we establish a connection. I know a Kiev and so on. So, uh, we establish a connection. I can go back. I can go into my contacts contacts list right now. It's the one at the top. And from here, um, one of the features that is available, it is there is a trusted chat that is, again, encrypted from, from end to end. And you can see that communication going, going back and forth. That's also a feature that it, it needs to be developed and explored. But that communication it is a trusted communication and private just between those two peers. I, from here, I can also send a proof request. Um, let's say I'll ask the same thing. How about I want to ask if you're over 19 again and some other information? So I, I have to get a notification. Okay, so here, so I go into my notifications. I see that I got a proof request. So I view it. I can choose to share it or decline it. Should I decline it or should I share it? Uh, it's your call. It's your information. All right, you're well, in control. Let's <laughs> just share it so that they can see what happens. So you can see that the information was sent, and he gets it in his chat list. And then he taps on it, and you can see the information presented. So, okay, yeah. So that's a that's a an overview of the all the work that's been done over the last little while. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so there's a lot of new features uh, that has been developed already in, using, again, um, Hyperledger technology, including Ares by Fold and Ares Java, JavaScript framework, framework JavaScript. Um, and there's also a lot of features that needs to be developed. So a little bit of call to action as well. Uh, we are open source, and we would love to see more collaboration. So please help us uh, help us get a develop this feature. I have Hi. A question. Thank you for your presentation. It was great. Um, okay, one last little thing there that showed up. I saw a request went over, and that was displayed in chat. But as soon as the request was answered, the original request disappeared. Right. So there should probably remain a chat log to indicate that. Yeah. Otherwise, it's, it's very broken up, and you can't actually tell what's happening, especially looking retroactively. Yeah. Right. Activity activity log is something that is is on is on. There's a lot of features that are still need to be rounded out, but absolutely, activity logs is something that we're looking at. Okay. Um, Stephen was laughing. It was smiling there when you mentioned about the credential negotiation because that's been brought up before too. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. It's ongoing. It's very active. You'll see lots of pull requests going in even uh, if you go look at the code base right now. OK, I might, might raise some issues on GitHub for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, perfect. Please do. A, a, a few, and pull a, requests. A few other um, items, and then I'm sure other people have questions. Um, so there's already a BC Services Card app. And the BC Services Card app lets you log into other services, including the CRA, um, CRA My Account, right? Yep. Uh, and that's awesome. We're one of two provinces that do that. It's great. I really like where the province is going with, with, with these things. Um, I also saw that there's a student section in your new app. Correct. So will the BC Services card eventually be now moved over, merged from the original app into your app? Mm -hmm. Will it be different? Do you see what I mean where, and where I'm going with this? And what other uh, verification, identification <laughs> verification will you have in your new app in the future? Driver's license, et cetera, et cetera. That is, that is a very interesting question. We, we have talked about it uh, uh, a lot. Um, for us, we have decided to leverage the, the identity proving process that already exists. So for us, if you had to develop that, you would delay our release of the wallet, you delay further exploring our uh, use case, the Lost Society of BC. So for now, we've, we have decided to leverage the, the identity proving process that has already been validated. And we just recently have actually reached that 2 million um, uh, business service card activation uh, at the moment. Um, so we are leveraged that identity proving process that already exists. And we decided to integrate our st instead of replacing. Um, your question whether we're going to have two apps or one app, it's still an ongoing conversation. From a user experience, um, I think even from the Open Wallet Foundation, we really embrace this idea that it's going to be eventually be multi-protocol. Right now, as Wallet, as, as Ares by Fold exists, it's more focused on the verifiable credential, verifiable credential, and a few other protocols that are starting to be implemented in, in, in Ares Framework JavaScript. But we envision that this multi-protocol will uh, manifest in multiple ways, um, and potentially we'll have that one app experience, right? Uh, but yeah, that's a good, again, our main focus of, the, of in investing in, on, on BC Wallet app and Ares by Fold is to, to have a very user-friendly user experience, and that's one thing that we're going to have to deal in the near future. Uh, right now, from our use case and, and adopting with the lawyers, they're very happy uh, with the user experience as is. But I, we don't think that is going to be an experience that is scalable through, uh, that for the wide out audience. OK. Uh, two quick follow-ups. Sorry. Um, timeline for rollout just for, let's say, after beta. Okay, Because it sounds like it's in <laughs> yeah. beta. Um, and then why don't you think it's scalable? Those are my two questions. So it's not that I don't think it's not scalable. I think it's not a. Consistent user experience is not a what is called what I call a delightful user experience. Uh, most users, the same way that you pointed out, there are two apps we've already noticed. It's something that got, gets brought up as well. So we want a delightful user experience. Um, I don't think it's fair to delegate that for the user to make the right choice of which app to use. So it's not from a scalability from the technical spec. It's scalability more from from a user experience side of view. So we just recently reached 2 million downloads and use, uh, app activation. So we we're going to need to explore how we can leverage all that and, and, and reuse that, right? So we can't just scratch that up. Um, from the timeline, I, we don't have any public timeline yet. 
uh, our approach is to roll out in a slow and a controlled manner, so we're able to test that out before we go to a wider audience. Um, in, like informally, our kind of informal goals, maybe in the next year or so, it will be available to the general audience, general audience but it's a very optimistic, uh, optimistic uh, date. We're at, okay. we're at time? OK. Um, do we have time for one more question? Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> uh, OK, my question is, um, it, it seems like this is it's very app-based um, from what you said. So I'm just curious um, when it rolls out more widely and you know people who maybe don't have smartphones or maybe have um, smartphones that don't use the Play Store or the App Store, mm -hmm. um, like is there an alternative for them, like an APK they can get, or would they ex be expected to use the the BC token, like is used for the BC Services card? as an alternative, I'm just curious what the alternatives are. Yeah, so as part of our mission is to provide users a choice of what technology as well and what channel they want to interact with BC government. Some of those may be uh, limited by the technology of choice. So for BC Wallet specifically, it does require a mobile app, a mobile device. Um, there is a number of other use cases and scenarios where people may decide to share an app. So there's very interesting scenarios there. Uh, from the very fiber credential ecosystem point of view, a token or a hardware device that is specialized, as you mentioned, doesn't quite work. But we're going to have to, to look into ways on how to achieve that uh, digital inclusion and also equity across multiple channels and give people the options to uh, the same access to, to the digital services as well. Multifaceted approach. If you guys want more, interest, or more information about BC Digital Trust, there's some... Uh some There's a info <laughs> sheets outside, and please feel free to pick one up. We're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.